look from last time through today and here this evening, we feel God working on a, an objective that he has for this meeting. And as so often happens in a true apostolic meeting, one thing builds upon another, upon another, upon another. And there is a theme that's already emerging and it's obvious that God wants us to pursue after the things of God like we never have before. There's something very uh, special in the Holy Ghost that many feel and many realize. I'm talking about men, women of God that have been serving the Lord for many, many years. And there is just something in the atmosphere that uh, is, is, is more powerful, greater than anything I've experienced in my lifetime. And, uh, and I'm so grateful for that because there are things that I have preached since I began preaching in 1966 that I believed, I preached about it when I didn't see it happening. Decades passed and I wonder uh, you know, when is it going to happen? Not if it's going to happen, but when. Amen. And I feel like that the church is entering into that place right now. Things are beginning to happen. God is confirming his word. Prayers are being answered. People are being delivered. Amen. Families are being put back together. Lives are being changed in remarkable fashion. This is a tremendous day to be serving the Lord. Amen. We're so privileged to be a part of this generation. Amen. Upon whom the ends of the world have come. Amen. I'll let you be seated for just a moment. I don't want to express my appreciation for the invitation to come and be a part of this meeting. I couldn't help but think back over the years as we watched the progress of this from its infancy to where it is today. And it's obvious that this meeting is meeting a great and tremendous uh, need in the conservative apostolic uh, part of the Pentecostal church. Well, that is a Pentecostal church. Let me rephrase that. But there is a tremendous need that is being met in meetings such as this. And you know, I want to just say a little word here. I was in prayer today thinking about the very things I'm talking about. And um, this came to my mind. And I'm not going to preach to preachers tonight. I came to preach to young people. Young people. I love young people. And, uh, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to address you tonight. But I was thinking when Brother Johnson, uh, Bishop Johnson, started this meeting 19 years ago, and uh, it was just to meet a need of some of the folks that he networked with and fellowshiped with. Things were a lot different then. Uh, many of us were involved in one group or another group, and uh, just the direction things were going and uh, some of the meetings that we took our people to, it caused more confusion than it did edification. And uh, looking for something to fill a need. Uh, he did not sit down and plan that someday we're going to be in a hall like this and be hurting for room. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is this. There's many a young preacher that would look at this and get stars in their eyes and say, you know, I want to have a meeting like this. And, uh, and uh, begin to plan and orchestrate. Let me tell you something. That won't work. That might work in the denominational world. That might work in the li liberal Pentecostal world. That does not work in an apostolic church, an apostolic movement. And, and if that's the way you operate or desire to operate, you really are not a true apostolic. You cannot orchestrate, plan, manipulate, or tell God how you want him to sign on to your program. 
and promote yourself. This is not here to promote personality. This is here only one personality that we're interested in promoting tonight, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know what I'm speaking about because Bishop Johnson and I are longtime friends. When we first met, we were teenagers in Oklahoma. We're both from the red dirt of Oklahoma. I have, uh, I have roots that go back several generations. Uh, I had great-grandparents who were involved in land runs in Oklahoma. I had several of my grandparents that was in Oklahoma when it became a state. And so I am a true Okie. Amen. As I'm, not, I'm not a transplant. And if I hadn't been born in Oklahoma, as soon as I was old enough to know better, I would have, come to, I would have gone to Oklahoma. But that's where Bishop Johnson and I are from. And, uh, and we've been close through the years. God's allowed us to have a great, uh, a great friendship. And, and knowing him and being around him uh, has been so inspiring. And he is a man of integrity, a man of faith, and a man that loves the work of God with all of his heart. And I, I'm just really, really thrilled for him. And uh, at an age when most men are talking about retiring and stepping back and, and, and uh, no longer being involved, he continues to be a strong voice in this apostolic movement and uh, inspiration to all of us. Amen. Praise God. Behind every successful man is a great woman, and his wife, Sister uh, Sharon Johnson, has been a tremendous asset to the church and to his ministry and the work of God in general, and we love and appreciate uh, her very, very much. you wonder if we support this meeting or not, from many years ago, we have sent our young people to this meeting year after year after year. We brought, we've been bringing a road bus, uh, chartering a bus the last four years. And this year, we had such a large group and had to bring so many vans and cars that uh, I'm already talking about we'll have to charter two buses if God tears is coming next year. Uh, the count I was given that 78 was here from my church, not counting my wife and I, and there may be a few that sneaked in on the side. That's a, that's a, a good representation, and uh, I'm thankful they're here, and uh, I want, I want uh, my youth uh, uh, minister to stand right now, Brother Stevenson, and I want uh, my college and career uh, youth pastor to stand right here, Brother Chad Short, and uh, what tremendous young men these men are. Both of them have a call of God on their life, and God is preparing them and using them. And I appreciate you men very, very much. Thank you for being here and being a part of this. And your good wives that are sitting there with you, I'd have to put up with both of you. And I, I, one more thing, and I'm going to get down to business here, but I'm very happy my wife's able to be with me tonight. There's been a, an extended period of time that uh, she's been through a, a lot of uh, uh, difficulties, a lot of health issues, and uh, it almost seemed like that it would never be possible for her to get out and travel and do some of the things that we like to do together. But uh, God has remarkably touched her just a few months ago, tremendous progress, and she's been traveling with me from time to time here and there, and I'm so thankful to have my wife with us tonight. I'm thinking about just staying with her. <laughs> this next year in May will be our 50th anniversary, so we've been hanging around quite a while. I probably ought not to say this. I'm going to give some of you kids the wrong idea. Before I say it, I want you to know I've been praying and seeking God earnestly about his will in my life. I was wanting to get married. 
I just couldn't find nobody willing to marry me. No, actually, I, I just wanted to make sure, and I'd been praying about that, and I met her at Texas Bridal College. And uh, I helped her and uh, some of the girls that she came, she actually came from Oklahoma, and uh, she was with a couple of my first cousin girls. They all came together. And that's really the first time that I really met her. And uh, me and some of my roommates helped them unload uh, their things and get it to their dormitory and all of that. When we got through and went back to the room, I told my friends, I said, that Dolores Lang, I'm going to marry her. And one of them said, oh, you don't have a chance with her. I said, you wait and see. So it, on my part, love at the first sight. On her part, it took, it took a little while. <laughs> she had a whole lot more to overcome to love me than I had to overcome to love her. <laughs> Amen. But I'm glad you're here tonight. I hope I didn't embarrass you too much. Amen. Would you stand with us, please? Two verses of Scripture. One from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 15. The second will be from Genesis 26, verse 18. I want to say how much I appreciate all the men of God that are here tonight. And uh, it's an humbling experience to preach with the caliber of men that have already graced this pulpit. And not to try to exalt somebody or lift one person above another, but in my own heart and mind, there's a, a, a special group of men that I feel like God has his hand on them in a very special way. They're key to this generation, this hour, and to the church, and uh, great men of God, and uh, several of them uh, have already spoken in this pulpit. Men that I love, men I respect, men whose voice I listen to. And so I want to say how much I appreciate you, brethren, and uh, you all mean a lot to this preacher. Amen. In fact, out of the three that's preached, two of them are my elders and on the elder board of our church. And uh, the other one would certainly qualify. I just haven't known him long enough or I probably would have twisted his arm. Amen. I, I sure love you folks very, very much. Amen. Ecclesiastes 3.15. Now, before I read this, how many of you like a, a riddle or mystery? Raise your hand. Like a riddle or mystery. This verse of scripture was a riddle to me, a mystery until God quickened it to my heart some time ago. But here's how it goes. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requires that which is past. How many of you got it? <laughs> Two hands. Let's see if we can get four maybe. Think about what it's saying. We'll read it slow. That which hath been, what's happened in the past, is now. Okay? The second statement, and that which is to be or to come, hath already been. It's happened before, but it's going to happen again. And the third statement, God requireth. He's not satisfied. He'll not accept anything less than that which has already happened in the past. Did, do you think you're starting to understand it now? Genesis 26, 18, And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. 
And he called their names the names of the wells after the names by which his father had called them. Two things I want you to notice. The third thing, I'm not going to deal with the names here tonight. But Isaac digged again. That which hath been is now. And when his father Abraham had passed away, the Philistines, the eternal perpetual enemies of the people of God, had stopped these wells up after the death of Abraham. My subject tonight is going to simply be this. God wants to do it again. God wants to do it again. Let's give thanks to the Lord. God, I praise you. I exalt you. Oh, hallelujah. Praise your name, God. Praise your name, God. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. One more time, a heartfelt praise to the Lord. I praise you, I exalt you, I worship you, I bless your holy name, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can be seated. Prior to the service last night, God had already begun to deal with me along the lines uh, that I'll be preaching tonight. And uh, it so ties on to what was preached last night and then again the things that have been preached today that uh, it almost sounds like that we are trying to tag on to one another. But rest assured, every man here does his own thing. We are apostolic. We do not tell preachers what to preach. And, uh, and we seek the face of God. And when God speaks, it just all fits together. And one of the things that I want to say in my introduction tonight that goes right along with the theme of this meeting thus far is that God desires for us to ardently pursue the things of the Spirit that he has made available to us. The promises that God has made, the things that God is able and desires to do for us when we walk in the Spirit and when we are led by the Spirit, God intends for us to pursue it with everything we've got. God does not come by and just pick out somebody at random and say, I'm going to really bless your ministry. I'm going to really use you. I'm looking for some people that will will fill uh, the bill here and uh, and, and I'm going to use you. And you have not been pursuing the things of God and earnestly desiring the things of God. It's not going to happen. God makes certain things available and then it's up to us as individuals to decide if it's important enough to us, amen, to pursue that, to dedicate our lives to that end and to that purpose. And so let's talk a little bit about a great man in the Bible that we're all very familiar with. And uh, I'm speaking concerning Abraham, referred to as father of the faithful, a man of faith, a man that was a friend of God, a man that had tremendous, tremendous favor with God, tremendous influence with God, a man that was able to talk to God as a man to another man and to literally bargain with God. And, And God acquiesced to his uh, request. And God agreed that if 10 righteous men could be found in Sodom, that God would spare that wicked, wicked place. Now we're talking about somebody that had walked with God for decades 
and everything in his life from the time that God called him. You read about it in the 12th chapter of Genesis. From that time forward, it was Abraham gave his entire life to pursuing the things that God had spoken to his heart and he walked in faith and obedience. And so because of Abraham's uh, faithfulness, God was able to grant to him those things that he had spoken to him about when he was a much younger man. In fact, there's one place in Scripture after that he had... uh, was ready to plunge a knife into his son Isaac that the angel of the Lord stayed his hand and God said concerning him, now I know you won't withhold anything from me. In other words, that was another test of many, many, many tests, but the ultimate test was would you even put your son's life on the altar for me? And Abraham so wanted to please God and desired the things that God had promised, not just to Abraham, but it was promised to his uh, offspring, those, his genealogy, those that was going to come after him, that he's going to be the father of a great nation. And he was willing to do anything God wanted him to do in order to see God fulfill the promises that he had made. He was totally sold out on God's agenda This is a man that did not put himself first or his family first or his aspirations or desires. He put everything on the altar and he committed his entire life until the day he died to pursuing the will of God and seeing the things accomplished that God said he wanted to do. He wanted to have a people in this world, amen, that would represent him, that he could use, he could bless, he could use them for his special purpose of bringing a redeemer into the world. And it all started with one man's willingness to put everything on the line. I feel that tonight I'm going to be preaching to some young people that God has already laid his hand on you. God's been grooming you. God's been dealing with you. And I'm not just talking about boys and young men. I'm talking about young ladies too. We all have a place in the kingdom of God. Amen. And God wants to ignite a desire in you tonight that cannot be quenched. God wants to put you on a path tonight that you'll never turn back from. Amen. God wants to put you on a journey to take you to the place that he had in mind when your mama gave birth to you years ago. Some feel that when God makes a promise, all they've got to do is just sit down and fold their hands and wait for that to happen. But God doesn't tell us these things so we can sit back and relax and wait until God does it. God sets these things to us so we will pursue it with everything within us. So Abraham, because of his faithfulness, his self-sacrificing and because of his obedience. Amen. He has become an eternal example to every generation from his time until God takes all of us out of here. He's the man. Aren't you glad that God found a man like Abraham? I wonder if God's going to find somebody here tonight that will be a great soul winner, a great evangelist, a great pastor, a teacher, a prophet, or maybe perhaps even an apostle. I'm wondering, and I really feel there is, I wouldn't even be raising these questions if I didn't feel like this was the case. But I wonder if there are not some people here tonight in this youth group 
that if God gives us just a few more years, just a few more years, we may be too old and feeble to do, but if I could just see it, if I could just see it, amen, that's going to be used mightily of God in the end time to wrap things up and get this church ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. I haven't even started on my message, but I'm just following what I'm feeling right now. Let's just pray a moment. Oh, gee, come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Praise God. We're living in a time when security and having something to fall back on has become more important than leaving everything behind and obeying the voice of God. Education is important, but if God has a call on your life, that's second to your calling. Somebody said, well, I'm going to be a preacher, so I'm going to learn how to be an accountant, so I'll have something to fall back on. Hey, That's not the way it works in the apostolic church. What you learn to fall back on is the anointing and the power of God and God's ability to do through you what you can never learn in a university. You can't learn it at a Bible college. You're going to learn it as you seek the face of God day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year, as you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as you learn how to fight against the forces of hell, as you learn how to overcome the lust of your flesh and the pride of life and the other things that are gnawing in every one of us. If you make a start for God, don't ever look back. Don't ever second guess God. It won't be easy, but it's worth the the battle. It's worth the effort. It's worth the sacrifice. Abraham had to leave all to follow God. Amen. And, And we have to do the same thing if we want to see the blessings of God upon our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. Praise God. So we know that Abraham left his land of his nativity. He left his family behind. A little while later, at the commandment of the Lord, he left his father behind and he began to go to a place that God said he would show him afterwards. In other words, I'm just going to show you where to go today. Tomorrow, I'll take you a little further. So he finally reached the place, and God let him know that this was the place. And Abraham's obedience, you know, sometimes you think, if I obey God, you know, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, on and on and on. But Jesus said no man ever left his father and mother and houses and lands and kindred and so forth and so on. But what he's going to be repaid in this life Right? And in the life to come. You don't ever outgive God. When you give God everything you've got, He's not going to just sit there and say, Well, good job. He's going to give back to you in the measure that you gave. Yes, He will. Amen. So, 
When Abraham got there, God blessed him with herds. God blessed him with flocks. And, uh, and he had places to, uh, to graze his cattle. He had servants and on and on and on. I'm going to move on uh, pretty quickly here. But one of the things that was very necessary in that part of the world was water. Amen. Had a lot of good things in that land. Uh, uh, you know, this is the land that God even selected uh, for Abraham's descendants to live. But, uh, but water was at a premium. And one of the things that we want to focus on tonight is that Abraham dug several wells at different places spaced throughout that land that now we refer to as the nation of Israel. And it has been the possession of his people uh, for the, you know, a major part of time since then until the present time. And so, uh, you know, there's some things involved here uh, in, in digging these wells. Uh, we think of wells that, you know, uh, maybe maybe uh, years ago, your great grandfather or somebody, uh, uh, they hand dug wells, and uh, there's some of those places still around in the countryside and, and uh, out in rural areas where where old hand dug wells, and you could see where they use rocks and they and they walled it up so it wouldn't collapse and fall in, and uh, some of those wells only get groundwater. Some of them have a little, a little more of a stream of water, an underground stream flowing into them. But what really, really is valuable is when you find a spring and you tap into a spring that has an inexhaustible supply of water. And these things that Abraham, these wells that Abraham dug were not cistern type wells that just catch and hold water or groundwater when it rains runs into them and fills them up. But uh, these were, these were uh, underground streams that were near the surface that he learned how to locate. He knew how and where to find the water by observation, by experience. You can go out into a semi-arid arid part of, of the world that we live in today here in the United States, even in Arizona where my good friend lives. And, and, uh, and I've learned to appreciate uh, the scenery there, beautiful, a lot of beautiful places in Arizona. But there's places where you don't see much growing. And then there'll be a little low place and you'll see brush and you'll see some trees and you'll see some other things going on. What does that mean? That means there's a water source not too far below the surface. And there are some places that a little excavation will reveal a wonderful source of water. I would to God we could become so spiritually sensitive that we would learn where to dig and where to tap in to where the water is flowing. Amen. Not just cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold any water, but springs of living water, amen, that God has provided for the church and we need to learn how to tap into them. Everybody say amen. amen. So uh, the, these, these wells that Abraham uh, uh, dug, uh, they, they continued to provide water for his uh, domestic use and for all of his cattle and God increased him and, and you know those that lived in that area envied Abraham and the reason why they envied him is because obviously the favor of God was upon him and so when Abraham died I want you to notice this I wondered why anybody in, in that in that type of, uh, of geographical location would go and stop up wells that somebody else had located and dug. But these Philistines so hated the people of God and it was obvious that Abraham was a man of God that as soon as he died, they went and stopped up all the wells. And so his son Isaac, that inherited the promise, had to come behind all of this chaos, all of this destruction caused by the Philistines. And the Bible says that he digged again the wells of his father Abraham. Everything that happened to Abraham and to uh, Isaac 
and Jacob and those patriarchs of old have significance and a type for you and I today. I believe what this was telling us is that every generation must have their own first generation experience. You can't live off the experience of your mom and dad or your grandparents or somebody else that you look up to. Every one of us needs a first generation baptism of fire, a first generation revelation of hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Every one of us needs a revelation of the doctrine of separation and holiness unto the Lord. We're not just doing this because this is the way it's always been done. Amen. Because when one generation passes off the scene, the Philistines come in and try to stop up the wells of your apostolic heritage. And you're going to have to dig again the wells that your forefathers dug. Praise God. So Abraham had left a heritage, an example. And if Isaac had been paying attention, and I think the narrative proves that he, that he had, he knew a little bit about what dad was looking for when it came to digging wells. And he went back to all those old locations and he said, I was just a little boy but I remember how many, might have been for weeks or months that they worked on this spot right here. But boy, they dug out a wonderful, wonderful spring. And he said to his servants, we're going to have to do the same thing that daddy did. We're going to have to dig this, this debris out of here, the rocks, the branches, the stumps, the garbage, the trash. We're going to dig it out of here. Amen. It may not look like anything right now. It may look like nothing but a junk pile. But let me tell you, when we get the debris out of the way, you're going to get to taste of some wonderful, wonderful water. <laughs> Praise God. And have you ever wondered why did the Philistines stop up the well? Here's the deal. They weren't interested in anything that was connected to Abraham and Abraham's God. But they didn't want Isaac to enjoy what his dad had left for him. I'm here to tell you tonight, every young person of the sound of my voice the devil wants to steal your victory. The devil wants to steal your holiness. The devil wants to steal your chastity. The devil wants to drag you through the muck and mire of this immoral, ungodly, perverted world that we're living in. But you need to get some grit in your crawl. Amen. You need to get a backbone. You need to get a desire that says, I'm not going to give in to the pressure of the world. I don't care what the church across town is doing. I'm not interested in dressing like Hollywood. I'm not interested in going to organize sporting events or being involved in it. That's not where my desire is. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. All the days of my life. Amen. I want to see God's glory. Whatever's in your heart is what you're going to pursue. But I believe I'm talking to some young people tonight that's not interested in the new charismatic apostolic movement. Somebody said, well, they're not that much different than we are. Yeah, but just a while back, they were just like us. So that lets me know they're headed in the wrong direction. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in following the trend and fashion of the Pentecostal movement. I'm hungry for a move of God. I want the old paths. I want back, amen, the apostolic church that I was born into when I was just a baby. I 
I'm telling you tonight, young people, you have to get it for yourself. Amen. Your pastor can believe it and preach it. Amen. The young, uh, whoever you've got for a youth leader, or youth minister, or whatever, they can love it and preach it and believe it. But listen, that doesn't substitute for getting it for yourself. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. You're going to need to get into this Bible. Amen. And get a revelation for yourself. If you don't understand one God, take your Bible. Get on your knees and pray. And ask God to give you a revelation. And then look, open your Bible and begin to read. And then pray some more. I promise you, if you'll seek God for a revelation, he'll visit you with a revelation. Praise God. You want a revelation of what we call holiness or separation? Somebody said, well, I wish we had a uniform code that all apostolic churches, uh, you know, uh, subscribe to. And, and we could all agree on every little thing. And wouldn't that be great? No, it wouldn't be. And I'm going to tell you why. Because holiness is not a set of rules. Whatever standards that we set and enforce in the church is just to have a means of helping people understand what it means to live a holy, godly life. But you can have a form of godliness. I was down at the hospital last week and I saw some Catholic sisters and these were the old-fashioned ones. And man, if we're just talking about externals, they pretty well covered up. You understand what I'm saying? That doesn't mean they're holy. I'm going to tell you. Sit down. I won't tell you. I'm going. I'm going to tell you what what separation is. Real simple. Real real simple. I don't even think I'll spend more than two or three more minutes on it. You know what it means to live a holy life? It means to live. A life with the single thing in mind. I want to please the Lord. And everything you pass it by, is this pleasing to the Lord or not? If you're trying to select a certain style of clothing to wear and you've kind of got a little question in your mind, just ask yourself, would I want Jesus to come today while I'm wearing this? Would this be an appropriate bridal gown to be wearing? Would I want to be reading this if Jesus came today? In other words, it's just that simple. Just fall in love with Jesus, amen, to where you want to please him more than you want to please yourself or anybody else, and you'll be living a holy life. Because you'll learn how to listen to those little nudges that the Holy Ghost gives you. Amen. That little question mark. I don't know about this. If you feel like, I don't know about this, that's the Holy Ghost telling you. Jesus wouldn't be pleased with you wearing that. Jesus wouldn't be pleased with you going there. Jesus wouldn't be pleased with you hanging out with this crowd. Hallelujah. When you fall in love with Jesus, pleasing him is number one in your life. Hallelujah. That's holiness. That's true holiness. That doesn't mean we don't have standards. I'm not talking against standards. I'm talking beyond standards. When it's more than a rule, it's a conviction. It's more even than a conviction. It's a desire. 
We do those things that pleases him. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated in the broad parameters of what we would call the apostolic movement. Basically, just anybody that believes in one God and and the essentiality of the new birth experience and some semblance of a holiness standard. There are those people that give themselves to trying to come up with some new program some new gimmick, something that they can compete with a charismatic church in their city. Listen to me tonight. Forget it. You can't compete with the charismatics as far as buildings, all the money that carnal people pour into their coffers, Anything you build, anything you get a hold of as far as program or buildings or so forth, they're going to top you so much that your building doesn't even begin to compare with what they can build. There's churches in my town, charismatic churches. Some of them actually have an attendance of 20,000 on Sunday. Many of them have 10, 11, and 12,000. And it's considered a fairly small church if they only have 2,500 to 3,500. So we, we were not trying to compete with them. Forget it. The crowd that they attract, if they were really hungry for God, they would be going to an apostolic church. For a few years when we moved to the location where we've been now for the past 26, 27 years, we had a new building there. They would come in and they'd be so excited. There's a new church in town. But they weren't in there very long until they realized this is not what we want. They'd look around and they'd feel something they never felt before that brought conviction on them, which they'd never felt before. I've seen them not stay 10, 15, 20 minutes, and they jump up and almost run out of the building. Why? Because they're not interested in truth. They love their error. They love their false prophets. They love their prosperity message. Amen. They're not interested in pleasing God. They're all about pleasing themselves. We are not going to reach our generation with gimmicks and programs. We've got something they cannot compete with. We have the anointing of God upon our pulpits, upon our congregation, and they cannot compete with God. I'll tell you what gimmick and program I'm interested in tonight. I want somebody, amen, to show me how to pursue God, how to get closer to God, how to have more anointing, how to have a greater outreach into the community. Praise God. Solomon said Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, There is no new thing under the sun. Every kind of gimmick there is, every kind of program there is, somebody's already tried it. It just doesn't work for apostolic churches. Jesus even spoke about the old wine. It takes time to make old wine. Like it takes time to make an old man. But Luke 5, 39, Jesus said, No man also, having drunk old wine, straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. The old is better. 
if your heart hungers and thirsts after the things of God, when you are introduced to that old time apostolic Pentecostal experience, amen, been in an old time apostolic service, amen, where people are slain in the Holy Ghost, Oh, I'm not against the shouting and the jumping and all that, but that's not what makes saints out of people. I see people hopping and popping everywhere I go. Get a little music going, a little beat going, and man, they'll be dancing in the streets. Hey, I see it. You've seen it. Amen. That's not a proof that you're uh, of God and that you're having a real move of God. I'll tell you what really turns me on is when I see people laying on their faces, wetting the carpet with their tears and surrendering to God and getting an experience that will be with them the rest of their life. One of the first revivals that Elder Moody held for us many years ago and uh, close to probably about 30 years ago. And uh, one night just... Tremendous, tremendous move of God. And he did such a capable job of following the spirit and directing what was taking place. And uh, several young people uh, really uh, got lost in the spirit, really got a touch of God. And uh, my oldest daughter, I think she was like 14 or 15 years old. uh, She uh, was praying and she went out in the spirit and uh, Way up in the morning, we finally picked her up and carried her home and laid her in her bed. And she was still talking in tongues when the sun arose the next morning, totally oblivious to where she was at, just lost in heavenly places. It's hard to walk out on God when you get an experience like that. That... That's what we need in this day and hour is go looking for the old paths. Let's dig out some wells that have been stopped up. Come on, generation. What do they call your generation? Have they put a name on these kids yet? We've had generation X and Y and Z. Maybe this is generation Z. I don't know. They'll, they'll, they'll hang something on you here. Just hang around. Don't, don't, feel, don't feel mistreated. I'm, I'm a baby boomer. And that's if you're born between 56 and 60. No, not 60. But 46, you got between the year 46 and then what's the, up, and, and what's the upper limit? You, you wasn't, you're, you're not a baby boomer. You old codger, you. <laughs> We, we, I'm going to have to give you more respect, Elder. <laughs> it is about time. <laughs> but let me tell you something. God's got something special for you young people. Every young person, 30 years of age and younger, would you stand right now? Look around, young people. Strain your neck. Look around. I wish you could see what I see. I see a thousand or more. That's 30 years of age and younger. Now look, I don't want to, I'm not trying to nitpick or cross swords anybody or disagree. I understand where they're coming from and they'll understand where I'm coming from. But I do not believe that you young people are the church of tomorrow. I believe you're the church of today. Praise God. God can use children. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Not too long ago, back in uh, around... September, October of last year, there's a little boy in my church who got the Holy Ghost. In fact, Brother Brown's an evangelist. He's out of my church. 
we're not even counting him and his family in that 78, so uh, that puts you up to, what's that, five more, three children? Brother Sister Brown, his nephew got the Holy Ghost. And I believe he was six years old at the time. He might have been seven. But anyway, he was going to get baptized in Jesus' name, got it on one Sunday, and he asked at the end of service he'd get baptized the next Sunday. And I said, yes, of course. And uh, anyway, during that week, uh, they ran into some people that they had uh, done some business with. These folks had a little hobby farm, and, and uh, the family I'm talking about, Brown family, they live out in the country, and, you know, they got chickens, and they've got some hogs, and I don't know if they got any cows or not, but uh, anyway, uh, they sold some, uh, some hogs to, uh, to this family that lived out in the country, and they run into them, I believe it was in, uh, was it Walmart? Or, or, yeah, I believe it was Walmart. Anyway, this little boy went right up to that man, and he said, and not only is he young, he's, they're real, he's real small, real small for his age, and he went up to this man and he said, I got the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues and I'm going to get baptized Sunday in Jesus' name. And his mama said, come on, Lane, come on. Don't, don't, don't bother this man. He said, no, I want to hear this. Tell me about it. And then he said to Lane, he said, when I was a boy, I had the Holy Ghost and I talked in tongues and I was baptized in Jesus' name. And he invited that boy to church or that man to church. And, we, and that man went to church. They live close to Beggs, which is the uh, first church where I pastored a long, long time ago. And uh, now one of the preachers out from under me is pastoring there in that church and uh, they live close to them so we of course were glad for them to go to church there but they had seven children I believe it is seven children and now mom and dad has got the Holy Ghost mom didn't know anything about it and I think four of the children have received the Holy Ghost and been baptized six or seven year old boy won them to God the first week that he had the Holy Ghost before he even got baptized. That has fired me up. God will use anybody that will allow the, him to use them. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So, no man... Also having drunk old wine, straightway desireth new. For he saith, the old is better. Everybody say the old is better. Let me tell you something. If you ever get a touch of God like what I'm talking about tonight, you'll look back on past experiences and said it is nothing compared to what I have experienced tonight. Amen. I said, God has something for you tonight that you've never experienced before. A depth in God, a touch of the Holy Ghost, a real genuine move of God's spirit that'll forever change you. You won't have to talk about what grandpa told you. You won't have to talk about what your mama and your aunts and uncles told you about. But you can talk about your own experience when you met God face to face and God changed you and God touched you and God sent you. You can be seated. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm not anywhere as near where I need to, uh, I've got too much material to cover tonight. But I want to remind you, again, Ecclesiastes 3.15, that which hath been is now, that which is to be hath already been. Listen at the last statement. And God requireth that which is past. 
that word requireth literally means to search out specifically in worship or prayer to strive after to ask, to beg, to beseech to desire, to demand, to inquire, to get, to make inquisition, to procure, to request, require, and seek for. That's what God said. That's the kind of response he wants out of you. I want the past in the present. What I've done for the past generation, I want it in this generation. What I did at Azusa Street, I want it in this generation. What I did in Topeka, Kansas, I want it in this generation. What I did on the day of Pentecost, I want it in this generation. What I did in the book of Acts and in the epistles, I want it in this generation. He said, I require it. I want you to ask for it. I want you to beg in prayer, strive after, beseech, desire, demand, inquire, get, procure, request. Seek for it, that which is past. Again, that means to follow after, aim to secure, to pursue ardently, aim eagerly to secure, pursue and chase. The things of God do not come easy, but they're always more than worth the effort. The old wells are where they have always been. By the same name, same location, amen. And you know how you gain access to that? Prayer room, fasting, consecration, holiness unto God, faithfulness to the things of God, getting your nose into the word. Are you listening to me tonight? Go ahead and stand. I'm going to wrap it up right now. Amen. Everything you need, God has given us the equipment. He's given us the equipment. He hadn't put us out on the battlefield with inferior equipment. U.S. soldiers are the best trained and the best equipped army in the world. When they meet an enemy on the battlefield, they already know that they have superior weaponry and technology and superior training. The odds are in their favor because of that. I'm telling you, when you go out on the battlefield, the spiritual battlefield, it's where you're going to have to go and fight your way through some things. I want you to know this. You are more than equipped to take hell on, to take the devil on. Amen. A little boy can call on the name of Jesus and the devils tremble. He knows there's one God. Amen. And he trembles at the mention of his name. Amen. Everything we need to overcome and be what God wants us to be in this generation. Amen. God has abundantly provided it for us. I wonder tonight if there's someone that God's been dealing with for a good while. Amen. And has been calling you into a place of prayer and consecration and seeking the mind and the will of God. I wonder if there's somebody that God's talking to right now in a very specific way. I know every person could come and we're going to make an opportunity. But if God's been dealing with you about some things... I'm not just talking about young men. I'm talking about young women too. We need young ladies that are consecrated, sold out for God, desiring to do the will of God, to be used of God, to be in the place where God wants him to be. Can we ardently seek him tonight? Can we pursue him tonight? With heart, soul, mind, and strength. your name, Jesus. God wants to do again for this generation what he's done for past generations. He wants to manifest his power and show us his glory. 
Come on, make up your mind that you're going to put everything on the altar before you leave here tonight. Have we got ushers that can help us move some of these chairs out of the way? Please come quickly, man. Come quickly and help us. We've got a lot of young people that are trying to get to the front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your name, God. Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and stack up three more rows. You don't have to do it in one stack. Make two stacks. Stack three and then stack the next three. 